Please welcome Stefan Briebsch. He's clearly exaggerating. So I have 30 minutes. I'm going to spare all the com almost all the commercials. Uh, this is my company. We turned 10 this year, and we are celebrating our anniversary by um, creating special treats, which we disclose every 10th of a month. And since it was the 10th yesterday, you might be well up visiting our website and finding out what the current treat is, because it's going to be a cool one. And you already missed some, and there's going to be more coming up um, through the rest of this year. So, the world as we know it hasn't always been that way. About 66 million years ago, this was pretty much what the world looked like. Um, I'll flip back and forth a couple of times so you can see the difference. So, obviously, uh, we have continents moving around. And a couple of million years ago, they were quite a lot closer to each other than they are today. How do we know that? Well, first of all, the whole thing looks like pieces of a puzzle that fit together. And then um, there have been findings of uh, dinosaur remains in adjacent um, parts of continents or in parts of continents that used to be adjacent and nowadays are not. So obviously they have to be, they had to be adjacent at some point or otherwise dinosaurs would have been able to swim um, for quite a long distance which most of them probably were not able to. Um, this is a bunch of images showing you how that has evolved. It started with the giant supercontinent of Pangaea. If anybody can at some point explain to me why the Earth was like created or came to be with that one supercontinent and the rest was water, that's really fancy and I haven't I have completely not understood that yet, and I haven't been able to find a source um, able to explain that. Maybe just a lack of um, being able to find that. And then um, Pangaea splits into Laurasia and Gondwana, and that goes on. And this is pretty much um, the setting that we are looking at for the purposes of the first part of this talk. Um, so it's a beautiful sunny day and the dinosaurs flourish. Um, they have evolved for a few million years. Some of them grew really big. If you're big, you're slow. You cannot run away. So you're big, which kind of gives you safety because usually animals are not going to attack things that are huger than they are. Um, and then if you have a long neck, you can reach up high into the trees and get to all the delicious food that all the other ones cannot get to. So evolution basically provides a niche for every, um, for every type of animal to live in, right? Um, and this is my famous, most famous quote of the Jurassic Park franchise. Ian Malcolm, who says, ooh, ah, that's how it always starts, and later there is running and screaming. Uh, that kind of reminds me of IT, because always ooh and ah at the beginning, and then there is running and screaming later. Um, if you have kids, my kids turned nine years old last week, you're going to learn a lot about dinosaurs. And, and they know also those fancy names and things, that's Triceratops, and they actually, that's a child a child's toy. I think it's really cool. And, and it, it, what my kids learned today has evolved quite a bit from what I learned when I was a kid. If you remember the Flintstones, they had the Brontosaurus, which at some point they realized, oh, it doesn't really exist. It's basically a bunch of different dinosaurs. And then at some point they reinvented the, the Brontosaurus, so it exists, but it's different than the one that used to exist. So it's almost like in IT. Um, everybody knows Tyrannosaurus rex, the fierce predator. Um, and obviously, since Jurassic Park Part 1, we all, we all know that, and it has been beautifully 
brought to life by CGI and other things. And T-Rex, of course, um, just finishing his lunch there. So um, that's more one, of the, one of the more scary ones. This is blue, a velociraptor um, that has been famous in the Jurassic world like movies that are sort of sequels to Jurassic Park. And you know that one guy that does that thing? And then he has that weird look in his eyes, and he controls the raptors, because they are really dangerous. So those have been the guys that ate all the people in the first parts, spoiler alert. Um, and then in, in, the, in the later parts of the franchise, you have that guy who can control them. And actually, this is a children's wallpaper. <laughs> and, and I'm not paid to say so, but it's, it's available at a bargain price, so you might do... Uh, that, that's definitely what you want in your kid's bedroom. Um, that's a Utah Raptor. Actually, my son came up with that name. He, had, he got that from some um, CD about dinosaurs. And it looks like the artist has consumed substances before creating that. But, well, funny enough, that's a velociraptor. As of, based on scientific evidence as of today. So velociraptors, and you can actually look it up, um, was roughly the size of a turkey. They just made them big and scary for Jurassic Park. In, in reality, they are small, feathered animals. So that guy technically would have been that guy. OK, so 66 million and something years ago, give or take a few thousand years, bright, sunny day, T-Rex has just finished lunch. And suddenly, this happens. So that's an asteroid that hit the Earth. And I actually have to bring up my cheat sheet, because there are so many numbers now that I'm going to impress you with, but I couldn't possibly remember as all of them. So that asteroid probably was 10 to 15 kilometers in diameter. And it hit Earth near the Mexican coast in Yucatan, creating a 180 kilometer uh, a crater that's 180 kilometers in diameter. That's pretty huge. Um, it probably has caused a 100 meter high mega tsunami, and you can imagine how far those waves traveled. Um, luckily, the asteroid um, hit shallow water because if it hit, had hit deep sea, they have calculated that the tsunami waves would have been about four kilometers high. And I don't quite understand why somebody said it would have caused less damage that way. But anyway, um, anything within a 1,500 kilometer radius is immediately dead, because literally they couldn't stand the noise, right? Um, and there is an argument about whether there was fire or not. There is 600, no, that's quadrillions of tons of um, particles have been blown up in the air. And as they sink down, there is some reactions that might have caused them to kind of burn and burn down pretty much everything. Or maybe this has not happened. Maybe there were just bushfires. There certainly were earthquakes. And arguably, that event also has triggered um, various volcanic eruptions. Um, to put that in perspective, this is um, Hiroshima. And what we are talking about here is six billion Hiroshima bombs. So that's huge. That's what you call a global killer. And subsequently, um, science has come to believe that this is what triggered the extinction of the dinosaurs. Um, well, you may or may not believe that, depending on whether you think that Earth has been created 6,000 years ago and or is flat, but I'll leave that up to your personal taste. 
Um, so dinosaurs became extinct, and no, they are not the fuel that we burn today. That's um, plants and not the dinosaurs. And we know about the dinosaurs we, because we have been finding all those bones and putting them together and all that, all those stories we know about. Actually, there is two special cases, just like in IT. We always, always have special cases. Crocodiles and turtles. And with the exception of crocodiles and turtles, no four-legged animal bigger or heavier than 25 kilograms has survived that extinction event. And it's not even been the biggest one that hit Earth. There has been a way bigger one, I think, 220-something million years ago. Um, that's really, really scary. And obviously, um, Hollywood has all told us all about how it's going to work out when we see an asteroid coming towards Earth. But that's beyond the scope of this talk, definitely. So actually, you can see that. And this is, um, well, you can clearly see the line. Um, this is the demarcation line between the two eras. And obviously, a lot has changed with that dark sediment. Um, so I think s about 15% less sunlight has reached the Earth's surface because of all the particles, which has led to a drop in temperatures about 26 degrees Celsius. And probably that's the reason what uh, killed off all the dinosaurs. And I'm purely speculating now. This is what I'm telling now is not based on any scientific evidence, at least none that I could find or looked up. Um, why did the small animals survive? Well, I think that they may be better adjusted to maybe digging into a cave or hiding somewhere where it's warm, whereas a big dinosaur is probably going to have a hard time like crouching under a rock or something like that, right? And then dinosaurs are big and slow and they have a long gestation period and it takes one generation is basically a long time. And if you think about small animals like mouses, rats, stuff like that, whatever equivalent of that we had back in the time, um, they have a short gestation period, they have a short innovation cycle, if you want, and there is many of them. So if you kill off like half of them, it's probably not going to hurt that much as a population. If you kill off the majority of dinosaurs, you don't have to kill all of them, you just have to make them so scarce that they don't find a partner to mate, and that's basically going to, going to make them extinct. Okay, so... By now you're wondering what the hell I'm talking about, so let's talk about COBOL. Everybody knows COBOL, I mean everybody has heard of COBOL. And this is a blog post by Jeff Atwood. Jeff Atwood is one of the co-founders of Stack um, Overflow. You all have heard that one. Um, developers Google, or whatever you might call it. Um, so Jeff Atwood writes that blog that's called Coding Horror. And he found um, that article claiming that, well, there is 220 billion lines of COBOL, which is basically 80% of what exists in the world, and allegedly this is going back to 2009. So I was curious, because I thought, well, is that right? Is it really that much? So I started some research. Now, Clearly, that might, even if it, that may have been the truth in 2009, by now, that would look a lot different, right? So I was able to find that. Reuters, um, in 2012, well, Commonwealth, the Bank of Australia, has replaced their legacy old COBOL-based system with the help of Accenture and SAP. So you have a clue of what they have replaced it with, sort of. And it just took them five years and cost about 700 million euros. So what can we learn from that? You hire Accenture only if you have a three-digit million budget, because Accenture cannot operate on 32 million. Um, Google for Accenture and Hertz if you didn't get that joke, and it's going to be, you're going to enjoy it. Um, and then there is that. U.S. Government Accountability Office reports that I was able to find. 
This one goes back to 2016, where they wrote a report about federal legacy IT investments are becoming increasingly obsolete. That's basically the, how they open up, and they continue on. Um, the gist of the thing is, well, we probably need to do something about the legacy systems there. And it goes on, many use outdated software languages and hardware parts that are unsupported. <laughs> what a miracle. Have you ever heard of that? Um, but if it's 50 years old, it's kind of scary. Um, I'll give you a minute to read that one. Now, if the dinosaurs didn't scare you, I think that one should do the trick. Um, and to be fair, I know, I, I seem to know that they have replaced that. I, I read subsequently that they got rid of the 8-inch floppies, and I'm purely speculating that they are using 3.5-inch ones now, but I cannot prove that point. Now, you would argue that this is 2016, and it's probably, you know, still outdated because the, the world is moving so fast. Hmm. In the 2018 report, the title starts with further implementation of recommendations is needed. And they continue on saying that, well, we told you that you need to address these things. But you didn't. At least you didn't finish doing that. Maybe it's still a work in progress. Um, I urge you to look up those reports. Uh, actually, the 2016 one is really interesting because it lists some system like veteran affairs, like social security. They all have, basically, they have their stuff in 50-year-old systems, which is interesting. Now, 2009, what's the state of COBOL today? Must be gone, right? Nobody uses COBOL. And Atwood was actually arguing in 2009, well, if there's so many lines of COBOL code, there must be a shitload of COBOL programmers, but I've never met one. Actually, I am one. I did some COBOL back when I was in school. That was fun. Well, for various definitions of fun. Um, and then you remember the Y2K bug? I mean, the, the old ones in the room remember the Y2K bug? That was um, using two digits to save the date, and 99 turns into zero, and suddenly the comparison is off, so that's a problem, you know, an overflow problem. So they had to change all those legacy systems to four digits at least, and people have argued that the Y2K bug was just basically bullshit by the IT industry. They wanted to get time and budget to work on problems. Well, 600 billion US dollars have been spent worldwide, that's a Gartner estimate, and that was not to get rid of those systems or not to clean up those systems, that was just to prevent those systems from stopping to work December 1999, and I still remember going out midnight taking a flashlight, because I was not sure whether the light would go out uh, at midnight or it would still be back up, luckily it was. So. There was not a lot of bad things that have happened, but recently I read that a few aircraft had been grounded because they had like an overflow in GPS, some counter variable thing, and well, some bad implementations of the software were not able to deal with that. So they were just off by a couple of years, given the current date, and that would have, well, it's probably not a good idea to have that plane take off. Okay, so maybe everything is fixed by now. Let's look at COBOL in 2019. So IBM tells us that COBOL is alive and kicking because there is enterprise COBOL, and there is even an XML parser. Now, that's not an XML parser for COBOL. That's an XML parser in COBOL. So when you really want to set an interesting goal for a hackathon, ask the people to write an XML parser in COBOL. That might be fun, or maybe not. You can do web services with COBOL. There is other companies that offer products. 
Um, you can do Java and COBOL together. Well, IBM offers that, of course. Very interesting. I was even able to find a COBOL-based micro-web framework uh, with the funny name of COBOL on wheelchair. <laughs> I'm not really sure whether that is legit or if it's just a joke. And honestly, I'm not able to tell. Uh, but it exists, and, and there's actual code that looks like it might actually work. Um, there is GNU COBOL, which is an open source project, allows you to run COBOL stuff on contemporary boxes by cross-compiling to C. Oh, I'm missing the slide. There um, should be a slide stating that. That's probably gotten misplaced. Sorry about that. So that's cross-compiling to C. Very interesting. Uh, you remember what Facebook did when they moved off PHP? They basically cross-compiled to C++ in the first place, and then at some point started getting into cross-compiling PHP to Hack, which is a fork of PHP, and now they're working with Hack, which is technically a fork of PHP. And there is a lot of cross-compilation stuff that has been going on. So. Um, it seems there is a major difference between IT and dinosaurs. Dinosaurs at some point just die out, at least the big ones. In IT, that doesn't seem to happen. Those big ones are still around. And maybe you know that one. It's called the Annual Rings of Software Architecture. I'll give you a minute to read that. I think that's, um, I really like that one, and there is a lot of truth to it. And never forget that, you know, all that old crap is still around, and it doesn't make anything better if you hide the old crap in Docker containers. It's still the old crap that is being around. So there is no T-Rex inside any of you, I hope, that that would be like an alien movie and we're not going there, right? So there's a big difference between stuff dying out and vanishing and then stuff still being around. Okay, ah, that's the misplaced slide there. So this is 2017, and they still stick to the same number. That's uh, Reuters, uh, Thomson Reuters. They have been bought, now it's Thomson Reuters. And they're still claiming that basically COBOL does more transactions than Google. And I was trying to prove or disprove the point. I was not able to come up with, with uh, provable numbers, but it seems that Google is outpassing monetary transactions by far today. Still, COBOL is around. This is a job search that I ran this week. And you can clearly tell that Deutsche Telekom is looking for COBOL mainframe engineers uh, as of this week, literally. Right? And DATEV is what, what most of tax advisors use. They do Java, COBOL, and Assembler. Volkswagen. Well, COBOL host. If you're interested, you always wanted to be part of the e-revolution with the cars. You know, you can be... You can be <laughs> um, the Finanzverwaltung Nordrhein-Westfalen. I'm not going to translate that one. Union Investment, Spada. Fintech, Süddeutsche Krankenversicherung, Peter Hahn, even the fashion business. Yeah. And, and it's fun, it's sometimes they, they kind of sneak COBOL in the text body. Say, hey, you can do Java and Node and COBOL. <laughs> so, what is software architecture? Software architecture refers to the high level structure, yada, 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 comprises software elements, yada, 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 software elements, metaphor, yada, yada, blah, blueprint, design teams. Have I heard bingo? Um, I can't work with that. I don't know if you can. Software architecture seems to be one of the things where nobody even knows what it is. Um, Martin Fowler says it's stuff that's hard to change. I'm not sure whether I want to agree with him, because the thing that's the most hard to change is the choice of programming language. Is that architecture? It's hard to change. So, 
Um, I think this is an interesting th sentence. The architecture of a software system is a metaphor, analogous to the architecture of a building. So what is a metaphor? Is that a kind of visualization of the thing? Are we talking about documentation? Is it about shared understanding? Documentation, at the end of the day, is about communication. It's about communicating something to others. It's about getting the same picture. So maybe this is, in essence, what software architecture is about. Let's briefly think about building a house. Now, if you ask an architect to build a house, you're going to say, hey, I need a man cave, or I need a kitchen that's awesome, and I need a living room, I need so many bedrooms, and all that kind of stuff. And you know what the architect is going to say? He or she is going to say, so where do we get the power from? Is there a power line that we can connect to, or do we have to generate our own power? If so, how do you want to generate that? You want a fusion reactor, or maybe a diesel, or what, what is, you know, put up solar cells? Where do you get water? You need to, drink, to dig your own well? Is there a public water supply? Where does the wastewater go? All those questions that you tend to overlook and not think about. But they are the important factors. That's the stuff that's hard to change. If you build a house with heating that's like those new types of heatings that get heat out of the air, Wärmepumpe, I don't even know the English term for that, and, and those things kind of stop working in, when it's below freezing temperature, so if we have that next asteroid hitting Earth and everything darkens, nuclear winter without the nuclear, then um, maybe our um, temperatures drop 26 degrees and we're below zero and then the heating doesn't work. And that's hard to change. So architecture probably is uh, thinking about those things long term and making sane decisions. Now, have you heard about Conway's law? Who has heard about Conway's law? Okay. So, Melvin Conway in 1968, and he's the nicest guy, I've met him two years ago, he's really, um, he's an aged gentleman these days, and he's um, puzzled by the, the amount of interest his law gets as of today, and basically what he says is, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. Have you ever wondered why startups tend to build monoliths? because they have no communication structure. Everybody is in one room and talks to each other all day. So there are no boundaries. And you are very likely to build a monolith if that is the case. Have you ever wondered why there are so many companies that where, where they, ha where have, they seem to have redundant solution because Europe has built one solution and United States has built another solution? Yes, of course, because they didn't talk to each other and they were not sitting in the same room. And what happens if you try to consolidate that? Exactly, it fails. Uh, ThoughtWorks Technology Radar, a very interesting document that you should read on an annual basis, says ideally your technology architecture will display isomorphism with your business architecture. That's a bullshit bingo variant of basically restating Conway's law. And Uncle Bob says a good architecture allows you to defer critical decisions. That's the, I think that's the one I like most, and I agree most. I want to understand architecture as something that allows me to get going today and not having to make decisions that lock me into something in the future. That's the essence of architecture. And that's what's going to keep your software below 25 kilograms, so you're likely to survive the next asteroid. Since we have settled on things to be small, I will be done in three minutes, I'm just running over briefly. <laughs> um, we have settled on things to be small, right? So um, maybe microservices, where everything is like really small, is not the answer, and monoliths, like everything is really big, is not the answer. As always, the answer lies somewhere in between, and I think we should ponder more about the question, what is the appropriate size for a system or for a service or for a microservice?
The problem with software is it always starts small. You always start with an empty project, so it's small, even if you have some dependencies, and then it grows. And it never stops growing. And most of the legacy problems that I have seen have occurred because teams and companies have not understood to at some point say, no, we are not going to put that in this old software anymore. We have to start putting that next to that piece of software, right? We're not going to build up, add on to the existing house. It is obsolete now. We have to start building a new house. And obviously, while we are building the new house, we are still going to live in the old house. And maybe we are moving parts over. If you're an organization, then you're going to move over in parts. And there is usually no big bang migration. So maybe at the software level, we need to build Lego blocks or bricks to have our code as independent of anything technology and infrastructure so that we can reuse it. You can build a wall, a spaceship, or a car from that brick. It's all possible. So it's about decoupling. It's about getting small. The very essence of microservices is a great idea, but we have to consider how big our microservices is going to be. I'm, I'm always running over, didn't you know? I'm, I'll be done in a minute. So last thought, quality. If a microservice is like, say, one, 2,000 lines of code, and you can basically recreate it in two weeks or in a month, why should we care about quality? Can't we ditch all the quality stuff and just say, hey, do the cowboy coding, do some integration end-to-end -end testing, and if the whole thing doesn't work, we'll just throw it away and recode it? Yes, of course we could. It might even be very successful. But if we start on the assumption that it's a small microservice and we allow bad quality, and then that microservice grows, we have a big problem. So maybe we are better off sticking to the quality just in case the microservice grows and becomes a new dinosaur. Think about the plastic discussions that we are having these days. A lot of throwaway stuff is being created. And I'm pondering whether Conway's law does not only apply to organizations, maybe also to communities, maybe to um, the whole world. Maybe Conway is a, is a mirror. So maybe in the context of architecture, architecture means to, to look into the broader context and understand that so that we're able to embed something into that context. And I think as a society, we should think about more as a developer society and as, as a human society, we should think more about that. Are we going to build sustainable stuff or are we going to build throwaway stuff? And I'll leave you with that thought. Thanks for paying attention. <laughs>